you really do reap what you sow. Amen. Good and bad. You'd be surprised we're going to talk a lot about the good tonight as well as the bad. Why don't you go to Matthew, the 25th chapter, if you will, please. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Let's begin reading at the 14th verse. Very familiar. Verse 14, very familiar. Kingdom of heaven, says a man traveling into a far country. He called his servants and delivered unto them his goods. To one he gave five talents, to another two, another one. To every man according to his several ability, he straightway took his journey. When he received, he had received the five talents, went and traded the same, made them another five talents. Likewise also, he that received two, he gained another two. The one who received the one, of course, remember what he did, he digged into the earth, he had his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord, those servants come, cometh and reckoneth with them. He that received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five. Behold, I have gained beside five more. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful of a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter in the joy of the Lord. He that received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two. I've gained two more. The Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He that received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee, thou art a hard man. Reaping where you have not sown, together without straw. I was afraid, I hid it in the earth. There thou hast that is thine. The Lord said unto him, You wicked, slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I sow not, together where I have not strawed. You should have, therefore, have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I would have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him, said ten. And of course, he was cast into outer darkness. Very familiar scripture that has to do with reaping and sowing. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for Jesus. Holy Spirit, I need to be quickened. Holy Ghost, come and quicken my body. Let me speak as the oracle of God tonight. Lord, don't let anybody stay in this service tonight without being moved by the Holy Ghost, changed by the word of the Lord. Quicken us, Lord. Sanctify me. I take your authority, Jesus, over every demon power, every prince upon him, power of darkness, that nothing in this house can disturb or or uh, hinder the word of the Lord from going forth, quickened by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this matter of sowing and reaping, you know, goes two ways. It's both good and bad. You know, all, all my life and all your life, you, Christian life, you've heard this. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, that has a bad connotation, but it also has a good connotation. In fact, probably most of my message tonight will deal with the good connotation. The Bible said, in due season, you shall reap if you faint not. Now, there is a sowing to the flesh. There's a sowing to the flesh that brings a terrible, awful harvest. How many people do you know that sowed to the flesh? And you know, you look at their life and they are reaping on all sides. Have you ever seen a day where there's been such awful reaping, such terrible reaping for sins that have been sown, uh, physical problems, mental problems, family problems on all sides, people who have been sowing to the flesh and sowing to the flesh, and now they are reaping what they have sown. It's an awful harvest. You can see the effects of the sowing to the flesh here in the United States. Let, let's talk about what America's reaping now. Let's talk about the nation first, not just individuals, but corporately as, as a nation. Look what we are sowing, for example, in our public schools. You know, all through New York now, uh, the schools are in absolute chaos. We have teachers that are afraid to go into the classroom anymore. Let, let me remind you that in 1940, that's just one generation, in 1940, all classes opened with prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. They would pray first and then pledge allegiance to the American flag. But there was prayer every morning in school. That was one generation ago. God's blessing was asked upon the school. They prayed for the principal. They prayed for their teachers. And over the PA system, there was public prayer. School was opened with public prayer. And they said, one nation under God. 
And folks, he honored that. He honored our classrooms. This nation was number one in education. I don't even know where it is now. Many nations have passed us. Many of our kids can't even read or write anymore. In 1940, just a generation ago, the top seven disciplinary problems in our schools were as follows. The number one problem in school in 1940s, right up to 1950, number one problem was talking in class. Number two was chewing gum. Number three was making noises. Number four, running in the halls. Number five, cutting in line. Number six, improper clothing. Number seven, not taking out the garbage. Not disposing of the garbage properly. Leaving apples on the desk, for example. Now, today, the most recent survey, let me give you the top seven disciplinary problems in our American schools today. Since we took God out, we took prayer out, we took the Bible out, we want nothing to do with God, we chased Him out, we want nothing that resembles God in our schools. Now, when I say we, we're talking about the liberal mind, we're talking about the godless people who have pushed this upon our society. The number one problem in our schools today, rape. Number two, and this, this is documented, <clears throat> robbery. Number three, assault. Number four, burglary. Number five, arson. Number six, bombing. Number seven, murder. That's one generation, folks. We are reaping. All of these are related to drug abuse. Every one of these problems have to do with young people that are on drugs. I don't know if you know that in Brook, up in the Bronx, in one of the schools just recently, a seven-year-old boy in first grade came and laid on his desk a whole bag of marijuana. And he was going to pass it out to his classmates. Seven years old in first grade with a bag of marijuana. I don't even know where he got it. I don't know the whole story. But it all has to do with drug-related problems. Well, we wanted God out. We let the devil in. It's payday. We are reaping in America in our schools what has been sowed to the flesh. They're calling now uh, for free condom uh, distribution in our schools, even to 7th and 8th graders. And now, you know what the latest, latest thing is now? Condom vending machines in all of our schools. Supposedly to protect our young people from AIDS. But you know what that's saying to our young people? We condone your sex. We know you're going to do it, so just protect yourself. What an awful, awful harvest that we are paying right now. One half of all the births in our city now are illegitimate. 50% of all the babies born to our young ladies now are illegitimate. One half of all the children born. The script, according to the latest report, one-fourth of all pregnancies are now being aborted. Every one-fourth of all pregnancies are ending in abortion. And 22 million abortions already, and some believe it may be 25 million abortions, and many of them just girls going without their parents even knowing it. In just one generation, we've come from chewing gum to machine guns. Now, are you understanding how far we've gone and what kind of thing we have? In a Bronx school, a student brought a Uzi machine gun to class hidden under his jacket, loaded. There's reports of teachers now all over New York and in all of our schools, even in country schools now, have saying there's no uh, respect for authority. They curse the teachers. I don't know if you heard now that uh, uh, this past week, two days ago, I think it was, uh, the Pope was in, in uh, Germany, in East Berlin, and hundreds of young people were cursing. They were stripping off their clothes, and they were throwing paint bombs at his Pope mobile. First time, any kind of reception like that, young people, wild and absolutely, uh, and, and these were young people who were admirers of Hitler. Right out of school, out onto the streets, no respect for any authority. Then, of course, we they called uh, 20 years ago, well, almost 30 years ago, for a sex revolution in the United States. The liberal press... And, and backslidden theologians called for a new day of sexual freedom. They said, we don't want any more of your Puritan moral standards. They said, anything goes between two mutually consenting adults. Anything goes if you're adult and you consent, anything goes. 
And so now we have homosexuals that have come out of the closet, who were in the closet for many, many hundreds of years now, out of the closet, on the streets, parading, and now moving into the schools to teach their lifestyle, and then taking to the streets, and now it's become in-your-face perversion. In your face, like it or not. They'll parade down the street with signs, we'll get your kids, like it or not. Some harvest we've paid. Some payday. Now it's payday with AIDS. Oh, God help us. The new disease is now 4 million cases of chlamydia. Chlamydia shuts the womb. And it looks to me like God's going to have to shut one womb for every abortion with chlamydia. There, there's, there's a new papillion now, a new cancer, uh, a sexual cancer that is horrible. There are things that we just can't even understand. So far beyond our comprehension. Payday. Syphilis is returning now to the, to, to, to the uh, sexual generation. This uh, revolution, sex revolution, has brought back syphilis. I have a Christian doctor who's on our board. He was here last Sunday sitting on the platform. And Dr. Rice said, Pastor Dave, he said, just 15 years ago, I had to give 600,000 units of penicillin, 600,000 units for syphilis. He said, today, I have to give 4,800,000 units, and it still doesn't kill this virus. Think of it, 4,800,000 units, and it doesn't touch it because it's, it, it, it's uh, uh, becoming absolutely uh, immune. To penicillin. And now with his uh, papilloma, it's called, virus. That's attacking many young women especially. And there's no end in sight. Almost every time you pick up the paper anymore, there's some new disease. Sexually transmitted disease. Folks, it's payday. We are reaping what we have sown to the flesh in our society. Now, what does this word mean? You reap what you sow. <clears throat> Folks, the... The Lord means that. The Bible means that. Look what we are reaping with our children now when we allow child pornography. It is allowed. Child pornography is allowed. It's, it, it, it's rife all over the United States now. And now, listen to me, folks. In the past 10 years, one of the number one problems in our society is incest. And primarily, parents molesting their own children. Now, we don't like to hear these things, but folks, that is the, what has happened to our society. It's payday. You can't keep feeding this garbage into the minds of the American society without reaping in it. What we, what we are reaping right now. We've become such a degenerate nation of, of some parents that are like wild animals and they're like beasts. Folks, I can't imagine a father or a mother raping their own child. It's a, that has to be a beast. Where does that come from? We are reaping what we have sown in what we call sexual freedom. And now, folks, we're about to reap another kind of harvest, and that's an economic crash because we have become a greedy nation. Wall Street right here is the, the, the bed, the hotbed of all of this greed. Everybody trying to get their hands on it. one big glass killing and what's happened folks L let me let me I quote you something I just read in a newspaper by uh, the Federal Reserve officer he said don't worry about multi-billion takeovers now with their 10 to 1 debt load he said there's too many other unknown forces out there now folks out there has become a term Every politician understands it. Every economist understands out there is a whole unknown thing about society, about our economy. Nobody even knows where it's going. Nobody can explain what's happening. One day, and I've been warning about it for a long time now, one day, overnight, and I've told you the vision I've had repeated at least five times. I've seen, I don't know who the president is, I just see his chair, he's turned, his seat toward the window and he's got all of his cabinet and all of his counselors in the room and he turns and he says how did it happen and every man in the room has his head down and everybody's shaking his head nobody in the room can explain what happened 
And the president is saying, what happened? How did it happen? Folks, it's going to happen and nobody going to be able to explain it because it's payday. We have been reaping greed uh, or sowing greed and we're going to reap a harvest. God, God has warned us and he's given us many, many opportunities to repent. But there's been no repenting. The Bible makes it very, very clear that we are going to suffer economically. <clears throat> there's a good side to this now. That's the bad side that I've just given to you. I hope you're ready for the good side. The Bible said, you reap what you sow. But he said, if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap a wonderful harvest. Hallelujah. Uh, th th this whole story in, in uh, Matthew, the story that we just read to you, we went through it. I want to show you that the Lord is going to have a great host of willing sowers in the last days. How many believe that? God is going to have a whole host. He's going to have an army of people that are going to go out and sow the good seed. And before Jesus comes, there's going to be a great harvest. There's going to be a great harvest before Jesus comes. Now, this parable proves to me that God is going to have in the last day those who are bearing fruit. Now, often we focus on this one servant who goes out and he wraps his his uh, talent in a napkin. He wraps it all up and buries it. And many people think the church is going to be like that, that the, there's going to be so much sin, there's going to be so much wickedness, and all these things we talked about, the church is going to be downcast, Christians are going to be defeated, and they're just going to take their talent and bury it out of fear. This man said he's afraid, and he, he buried his talent. And people have the concept that the church of Jesus Christ is going to be so inundated with all kinds of problems that the cities are going to become so wicked and so violent. That is true. But this parable, if you see it in the spirit, is saying, no, that, there, that the majority in God's house, in the remnant, the holy remnant, are going to be bearing great fruit. They're going to be coming with their arms full. They're going to be joyful. They're going to serve the Lord with gladness. The Bible said these men said, I have gained, I have gained. There's going to be gain. Hallelujah. The closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the more fruitful Times Square Church ought to be. And I believe will be as the days come. Uh, you know, the Lord is not affected. The kingdom of God is not affected by the economy. The kingdom of God is not affected by anything the devil does. The devil can do everything he wants to. He can do all the demons of hell out. He can come down with great wrath. But that does not hinder in one iota the plan of God. God's plan is not going to be affected by it. Hallelujah. I was looking at this this afternoon in preparing for the service tonight. Our, our Lord is the one who's, the Bible says, who's traveling to a far country. And after a long time, he's going to return. And the talent here represents the measure of grace and revelation of Jesus Christ. Some One man was given a great revelation of Jesus. He was given five talents. Another was given two talents. Not, not as much revelation, but it was the true revelation of the grace of God. And the other was given a measure of the grace and revelation of Jesus. He buries his. But what happens... God says in the last days, he's trying to tell us that in the last days, he's going to have a people who trust him. He's going to have a people who are joyful in him. They know that he's not a hard taskmaster. If you think our God's a hard taskmaster, you're serving the wrong God. You have the wrong image. And that's why you bury your talent. That's why you have such a poor revelation of who Jesus is. Because you have a perverted view. You have never seen his grace and his mercy and his love for a lost humanity. Folks, I'm telling you, God is, God is absolutely, totally committed to saving a people. Do you understand he's committed to saving and keeping you from the power of the devil? He's committed to bringing you to his throne room. He's committed to presenting to you to the Father without blame, blameless before the Father. He's committed himself to that. 
He's committed himself that there is going to be a harvest in the last days. Hallelujah. So you can look at what the homosexual uh, uh, community is doing and, and, and say that doesn't concern the kingdom of God and his program. You can look at what is happening to our schools and you can grieve over it. You can pray about it, but that's not going to hinder the program of God. And, and I was, I've been very concerned about our young generation. We pray for our teenagers and that, but I'm going to show you in just a minute what God prophesied is going to happen. He, he, he's not going to let this generation be lost. There are going to be thousands and thousands of Christian young people in the last day coming to the Lord. Let me ask you, do you believe that the last day just before Jesus comes, there's going to be uh, a clearer and clearer vision of who Jesus is? Do you really believe what the scripture says that uh, though hell rages, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. That's the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God is not affected by demons or by the economy, by communism, by violence, or any world conditions. Hallelujah. This parable proves that God will have a last day army. Amen. I said, a last day army prepared. I want to show you a prophecy. Now, before I turn there, remember, Jesus quoted this prophecy. Paul quoted it, and it's quoted seven times in the New Testament. So clearly, this is a last day prophecy of conditions in the church just before Jesus comes. Now, if this is good news. Go to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. I'm going to show you a prophecy about our young people. If you're a teenager tonight, oh, ask God to let this lay hold of you tonight. In fact, if you're under 25, I'd say that's young. At my age, anything is young. Martin Luther said of this uh, chapter, a glorious prophecy concerning the kingdom of Christ. It ought to be one of the nearest, dearest scriptures to everyone in the church. One of the dearest, most precious chapters of prophecy in the Bible. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. What's God, God going to do with the enemies of Jesus? They're going to be under his feet. That's the prophecy. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Who is the rod of his strength? That's Jesus. Hallelujah. In the midst of thine enemies. To rule. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now let me show you what this means. Follow me if you will please. Amen. There's a day of his power. Look this way, please. The Bible says there's going to be a day of his power. Now, we know there's been a day of his power ever since Jesus arrived, ever since he was on this earth and ascended the Father. It's been the day of his power. He's shown his power for the last 2,000 years. But remember how God showed his power in, Israel, in Egypt? First of all, he, he, he shook the earth, and then he literally shook the heavens with thunder and with darkness, and he kept increasing the day of his power and increasing it. And what did he do? A final rage of death to the firstborn. There was a burst of power. And do you know what the Lord said he's going to do? He's been shaking everything. But he said there's going to be one last shaking. He said, I'm going to shake everything. There's going to be a day of his power. And we're living in that day of his power. And he said, and in the day of his power, when God comes down to start dealing with his enemies. And folks, he is dealing with his enemies now. Oh, yes. Even presidents in the United States, they can hide and hide. It, but if, 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 if God says it's time, he exposes it. That was Watergate, for example. And, and, and no matter who's in Washington, you can't hide from God. You can't hide. I don't care who it is, Republican, Democrat. You can't hide from God. God God's going to have his way. 
You're, you, some of you are too, too young to remember Khrushchev. He came to the United Nations here and, and sat there and took off his shoes and banged it and said, we're going to bury you. Well, he's, he's, he's in a grave and he's dust now. All of these world leaders, these, these, these dictators, God just snaps his finger, blows on dust. He said that the nation of the world, a drop of dust in a bucket. He has all power and all authority. And folks, we're living the day of his power. When the Holy Ghost came, that was the day of his power. And he's increasing his power because he's about to come. And he said, in that time, my people are going to be willing. Hallelujah. He said, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised yet once more, I'll shake not on the earth, but the heaven. My people shall be willing. Hallelujah. Now, the scripture says, it's, this people, this prophecy says that they're going to see the beauty of holiness. Now, folks, you've got to stop here and listen to me, because God really spoke this to my heart. There, there are going to be people in the last time that don't feel that holiness is a burden. That, that you know, this reproof and all of this, oh, no, I can't live like that. God says there are going to be a people so willing... And have such a heart for him that holiness is going to become a beauty to them. It's going to be a joy, a wonderful experience. And, and they're going to thank God for reproof that provokes them to righteousness. Because they're going to say, uh, and, and really from their heart they see these are beautiful words because it produces a beautiful effect in my life. It's producing righteousness. My people, he said, I'm going to come in power and it's going to be my day of power and in my day of power. I'm going to have a people. God's not going to send angels down to do his work. He's got us to do it. And he said, I'm going to make you willing. Not only going to make you willing to go out and sow the revelation I gave you of my heart and of my son. You're going to, folks, we're going to have people going around who know Jesus in such an intimate, personal way that everywhere they go, that's the witness. They're going to say, I know you know Jesus. They can see it on your countenance. Everything about you is the revelation of Jesus. You're not going out with four little scriptures. You're not going out with some little thing that you have learned to quote. You're not just mouthing scriptures. You are a living testimony of who Jesus is. And the, the Bible says you're going to have such a beauty about you. It's going to be the beauty of holiness that you fully accept you know, we've got preachers in the pulpit screaming, we don't live by law anymore. The law is dead. It's gone. It's all grace. Yes, it is grace. But he said, I'll put the law in your hearts. You will love to serve me. You will love to fulfill my law because I'm going to get the power to do it. Hallelujah. Folks, that, that, that's a wonderful church when people are serving the Lord just because they love him. Because there's a beauty in just walking with him. Hallelujah. That helps make you willing to obey him. Now, it says in verse 3, Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now, folks, I'm not the only one that saw this. I was surprised that uh, Jonathan Edwards, Calvin, Rogers, and some of the great uh, prophets of God and writers from way back for the last 300 years, I, I, I thought I had some new revelation. You know, when you go out, in the morning, and you see the dew on the grass. Now, you'd have to go to Central Park in New York to see that. <laughs> Anybody been in Central Park when the dew comes? Folks, I was raised in the country. And when you go out in the early morning and you look at the dew, it's like millions and millions of diamonds, those little drops of dew. And he says, God says, I'm going to have the dew of youth. I'm going to have a whole sea of diamonds. I'm going to have the youth. And that's before he comes. It's going to be too late after he comes. This prophecy is being fulfilled in these our very days. They're going to be fulfilled, and I believe it with all my heart. God is going to have the dew of the youth. These are his diamonds. And that's exactly, exactly. It, it, and here's the meaning. These are young converts, servants of the Lord, they shall be like beads, as numerous as drops of the morning dew. That's the meaning. As numerous as the drops of the morning dew. 
Folks, you don't go out in, in a morning in the field when the dew comes and just see a drop here and a drop there. The fields are covered with these diamonds. They sparkle in the sun. When the sun comes, they just sparkle. Has anybody seen that? Is, am I the only? Okay. All right. I thought I was the only one who saw that. Hallelujah. There is absolutely nothing in heaven or earth that's going to stop this last day harvest. Now, there's, there's something unique and special about these last day servants. This, this, these, these young people, especially, that God is calling and these willing people. They're not going to be afraid to plow in the cold. Your scripture says the sluggard, that's the lazy Christian, he will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. You know who these people are? They're not going to have anything. It's harvest time. And the Bible says there's going to be some. There are going to be churches just dead. There are going to be churches in this city while we are packed and our alders are filled and people getting saved. Your families and all over. The dew is falling everywhere and the diamonds are shining. And God's people are willing in a day of power. There are going to be people saying, oh, it's too cold out there. You know, the, the, the demon powers are out there. The, 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 the rapists and, and uh, uh, people don't want God. You know, when I came to New York City and talked to some pastors about my vision of coming here into Times Square Church, they said, they don't want God here. I've been here 15, 20 years, nothing happens. You can't have any church Sunday night. It's too cold, you know. People are not going to come out. People are not going to, the, the, the subways are so dangerous. The city's getting so wild. They're not going to come to it. They might come Sunday morning and that's it. Everywhere I got, you can't do it. Can't do it. It's too cold. Too cold. I don't mean, you know, the weather, but I'm, that, that, that's what it means. It's too hard. It's too difficult. It can't happen. I got so sick and tired of that. I got so sick and tired of that everywhere I went. If I listened to what I heard from my minister friends, God bless them. I'd have never come to New York. They about tried to scare me to death. One pastor hadn't seen a soul saved in 10 years. At least that's the impression I got. Death everywhere. It's too cold to plow. God says, you go out in the cold and you plow. Doesn't matter what the weather is. Doesn't matter what people say. You go and plow and you sow your seed. I'm going to give you a harvest. Hallelujah. They said, oh, you, when I first came here, drug, drug addicts can't be chained. Nobody can. Drug addicts. When I first came to New York, there were, there were no ministries on drugs. In the United States, we were one of the first to, to prove to the world that Jesus could save a drug addict. It, up to that time, it was hopeless. Because at that time, in 1958, there was no heroin. Very little. Most of it was pot. Then in 19, after we were here about a year, all the, the drug addicts, all, all the gang leaders I was working with, I was preaching to gangs first because there, wasn't, there were no drug addicts on the street. Just musicians smoking pot and a few things. 1958, 1960, heroin hit. And all these... Gang members that I was working with were on the streets. Now, they weren't fighting. They were just trying to get money to support their habit. And I noticed kids out in, in the cold of night, uh, you know, it was zero out, and they had no jackets on. They didn't feel the cold. And I was figuring out, man, these, these kids don't even feel the weather. I went up to one, so it's one. He said, I'm high, I'm high. He couldn't feel the weather. And, 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 and I began to suddenly see these kids vomiting and laying all over. And suddenly, I didn't know anything about drugs, but nobody, nobody believed then. Not even the church believed that a drug addict could be saved. Too cold to plow. God said, I'll save them. And folks, thousands and thousands have been saved now all over the world. Hallelujah. I'll tell you something else. These willing servants are not going to be afraid of the lion out there roaring. The scripture says the slothful or lazy Christian saith, there's a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. Proverbs 22, 13. Proverbs 26, 13. The slothful man says, there's a lion 
out there in the way. A lion is laying and waiting in the street. Devil's too powerful, they say. He's got the whole world in his hands. You know that song, he's got the whole world in his hand. They're talking about the devil. I don't believe, I believe God has the whole world in his hands. You know what the Lord said? Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in hither the poor, the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. Bring them in. He said, don't be afraid of the lion. Uh, some of you remember uh, about two years ago, there, there was so much talk about crime in the subways and everything. I got to thinking, boy, one of these days it might affect our People won't come on Sunday nights and Tuesday nights. They only come Sunday morning because of the crime. And so on a Tuesday night or Friday night, I open up the microphone and I, I said, if the Lord's delivered you from, a, you know, somebody tried to attack you and everything, come up and tell us about it. And I'll tell you what, I, I heard one after another. We were here for about an hour, remember, hearing testimony after testimony of people who've been delivered one lady, she said, I carry my, I don't know if she's here tonight or not, I carry my Bible in the subway. Anybody come around to hit me, she said, I'll use this as my club. This is my club. <laughs> and I, I, had, I had sisters all over the church said, Brother Dave, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I was the only one afraid. <laughs> Nobody else. How many are not afraid of the lion out in the street? Come on now. I'm not afraid of the lion out in the street. He said, go out into the streets and lanes of the city. He didn't say, go out in the lanes of the, except New York City in 1995. Said, go out quickly in the streets and bring in the hither, the poor, the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. But you know, there's a growing number of Christians, and I'm going to preach about five more minutes. There's a number of Christians now that are he heading for the hills. They're hiding. In fact, I get letters now from people on my mail list that, Brother Dave, and they say, I'm prophesying to you. I heard from the Lord. You have to get out of New York City quickly. You've got about six months left. It's going to be bombed. I've got others saying, Brother Wilkerson, God's telling everybody to flee to the hills, go to Montana, go to Wyoming, go somewhere and get a farm. There's a book just been written, and it's, it's by a Christian who's a member of the Coalition on Revival. And let me, let me read to you what he says Christians have to do now. They have to go out in the country and get at least five acres. You have to have $500 of silver U.S. dimes, a six-month supply of dehydrated food, a home water filter system, water storage facilities, chemical toilet, kerosene heater and lamps, survival stove, fire extinguisher, at least one forty-five Colt automatic pistol, this is, this is a, in fact, this man's a preacher who wrote the book. You've got to have a 30 6 rifle with a four-time scope, a 12-gauge shotgun with pump action. You, you must have ammunition of 500 rounds, 22 long-range ammunition, air rifle, reloading equipment, high-quality first aid kit, battery-operated shortwave radio, citizens' band radio, 50 pounds, one can pounds of coffee for exchange. <laughs> 100 six ounce tins of cigarette tobacco so you can trade when the crash comes. 20 pounds of inexpensive pipe tobacco. One case of expensive whiskey, preferably Jack Daniels or wild turkey. That's what it says. Thirty Mexican gold coins, five U.S. twenty-dollar gold coins, and he says the booze and the tobacco is to bribe the law, the sheriff, in time of anarchy. You bribe people. Come on, this is a Christian. This is a, a preacher. He sent me the book, and I start reading through this. I said, I got to think. I can't find any of that in the Bible. I can't find any of that. My Bible says, go quickly out into the streets. Bring them in. Folks, you know where I want to be when the crash comes? Right here. With God's people. I'll tell you something. Let me tell you something. 
you're going to be safer here. Have you been reading the news about those people out in Montana? At a farm? With the FBI? They've got their guns, they've got their kerosene, they've got all that, they're in jail! And we're here winning souls. Let me close with this. Bible said, he that seeks to save his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says they're going to cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them. While we are praising God, we're going to go out in a blaze of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn around to these three people and say, God has everything under control. God has everything under control. Everything. Stand, please. He said, Brother Dave, if you believe hard times are coming, why aren't you storing food? I've been storing food. Right here. <laughs> Beloved, our security is not in guns, not in a stash of food. Our security is in our Lord. Hallelujah. Beloved, he's kept us to this time, hasn't he? No matter what happens, he's going to keep his people. He's going to keep you. He's going to keep me. Hallelujah. Folks, what I'm trying to say tonight, and the last thing we'll say to you, the Lord wants you to come to church with hope. He wants you to have hope about the salvation of your family. He wants you, when you walk the streets, to know that angels walk with you. He wants you to know that he wants you to be absolutely fearless. And he wants you to, to, to boldly tell everybody you can about Jesus and believe, believe that God's going to give you a harvest. That, that you know, many may reject it, but folks, you're going to find more and more people are open. People are hungry. They want to hear. And folks, you've got to believe what the scripture says in, in Psalm 1. I believe that with all my heart. To me, that's not theology. To me, that's not just something I read and forget. I believe that with all my heart. And that gives me hope for the young people, and not only in this church, but in this city. No matter how they curse, no matter how they drink. It may be, look, I, I've thought for a whole while we've lost the whole generation. And then I go to the word that says, no, he says he's going to have the dew of the youth. He's going to bring diamonds out of these kids. He, they're going to be diamonds that shine. Look at, look at Timothy. That's all these guys in the front rows here. These, these were guys that society and everybody else gave up on and for, for Sarah House here. And folks, we've changed the name from Hannah to Sarah. We had to because there's a whole bunch of other Hannah Houses all over the United States and people are mailing us. We're confused by it, so it's called Hannah House. But these girls that are up here in the front, they are diamonds. But people would have thought nothing could have been done. I'll, I'll tell you something else. Up there, down here, if God can save you, he can save anybody. If he saved you, he can save anybody. If he saved me, he can save anybody. Yes, hallelujah. God, give us hope. Give us faith. We are not a defeated people. We are victorious people. God, God gave us uh, what I believe is the best theater in this city, right in the middle of Broadway. He's raised up a standard, and he is saving people left and right, people uh, from all walks of life, and he is moving by his spirit. God, help us to act and move, not in cowardice, not worried about a lion in the street or the coldness of conditions, but to trust him in all things. And Folks, we intend to keep plowing. God sent me here to sow... And, you can't sow till you plow. We've been plowing and plowing, and now we're sowing, and we're going to reap. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
we don't try to pack this altar or anything else. We're just here uh, to serve God's people and to reach those who are in need and the lost. But I feel that there's some balcony in the main floor. <clears throat> and here's what the Holy Spirit put in my heart just, just a moment ago. Some of you standing here have no joy. I don't know if you lost it or you just misplaced it. But the joy of the Lord is not there. You, you, you sat and you heard the message, but you sat with a burden hanging on you. Just hanging on you. Bring that burden to the Lord now. But please don't come unless you're going to believe with me that while I pray and we pray together, that's going to be lifted from you. Because the Bible said the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I don't want you to walk out of here weak. You that have come forward, if you can look this way for just a moment, please. I am so, uh, there, there's such a joy in my heart when I know how much he loves his children. The Lord loves his people. If you can only get this down, so you have to be totally convinced that God's not mad at you. If God were mad at you, he'd cut you off long ago. We'd all been cut off. Because we deserve it, but he's a God of love and mercy and compassion. Yes, he's a holy God. He's a just God. But that whole, that, that the wrath of God is against those who reject him. Those who reject his call, his plea, and his many, many mercies that he uh, extends to his people. But you're not that kind. You come here because you love him and you want him. And you, you want your heart given to him. Isn't that why you came? You want to give your whole heart to him? How many could say amen to that? I want to give my whole heart to the Lord. I want to hold nothing back. Now, if you have a besetting sin, often sin uh, brings condemnation, guilt, and it cuts off the joy. It's, it's hard to be in sin and have any joy. It's almost impossible. The only joy you can have if you're living in sin is a false peace and a false joy. So let the Holy Spirit... Bring that right out into the open and say, Lord, I know why I don't have joy because I'm still living in sin. And you're going to pray with me that God break the power of that sin through the Holy Ghost. The Holy God will put the Holy Ghost in you with such power that, that you don't have to struggle. The Lord will just powerfully encourage you and strengthen you so that you're not fighting it in your own strength, but in his power, his strength. And listen, if, if, if you're listening to the lies of the devil, the devil will lie to you and say that you're not going to make it. Uh, he will bring depression on you. Sometimes it's physical. Sometimes it's mental and, and, and spiritual. And many times then he will just come and harass you with lies. But I'll tell you, wait, you know how to deal with the lies of the devil? Just remind him of the truth of God's word. Remind him of the truth of God's word. The devil has to flee at the truth. He can't handle the truth. Hallelujah. You just say, my Bible says, my Bible says if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me, to make me clean. And when you're clean, the devil has no rights. Now, I'm tell you, I want to tell you something. No matter how long you serve the Lord, no matter how you are in the Lord. He's always going to be an accuser of you. You're always going to have him accusing you. So just don't put up with it anymore. Say, devil, I've had enough of that. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. I'm going to believe what God's word says. I'm going to stand on the word of God. That's when joy comes, when you take your stand on the word, not on your feelings. If I lived by feelings, I'd never, hardly ever be able to survive. You can't live by your feelings. Amen. Pray with me now, right out loud. Jesus, I give you my heart with all of its sins and all of its weaknesses. And I come to you for help. Forgive me and deliver me from all the power of sin. Fill me with the Holy Ghost that I may have power and authority against the devil. Take all the fear out of my heart of the devil's power or the power of my flesh and help me to understand 
that he who lives in me is greater than all things else. All other things. Yes, all other things. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Lord Jesus, I want my joy back. Give it to me by faith. I believe you saved me. And I believe you can keep me. I come like a child in simple faith. I give you my heart, my confidence, and my love. All right, now I want you to just raise your hands and love Jesus right now. Just love him right now. Love him. Lord, I love you. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for caring about me. You'll never cut me off. You'll never cut me off, Jesus. You won't cut me off. Hallelujah. You won't cut me off. The Lord will not cut me off. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you will never cut me off. You'll strengthen me. You'll heal me. Deliver me. Glory. Hallelujah. To what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you is my title. To what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you? Now, I want to tell you before I start. <clears throat> the Bible said, if you, if you have not the Spirit, you're none of His. You can't be saved without the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. You understand that? We've got to fully understand that all salvation, all changed hearts is the work of the ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit in hearts. So you can't say, I don't know the Holy Spirit. If you're saved, you know the Holy Spirit. You've had his work in your heart. So don't excuse yourself. I, I've preached sometimes on the Holy Spirit. People said, well, I don't think I have the baptism of the Holy Ghost like you would describe it, Brother Dave, or, or people in your church. So I think I'll just sit back and relax. That's for spirit, so-called spirit-filled people. Well, I want you to know nobody can get away from this word this afternoon, because if you're saved, you have the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your heart. To what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you? Was there any advantage to it? Or has it been to no advantage whatsoever? Heavenly Father, you put this simple, simple message on my heart for the body of Jesus Christ here and Broadway and Times Square Church and for those who may hear it on tape. But I pray for a special anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, come upon me now. Give me a sanctified mind, a clean heart, a pure vessel. Let the words flow from your very heart. Let me be just a channel. Lord, we take your authority over every hindering spirit, over everything that would block the mind and the heart from receiving. Lord, I thank you that through prayer you do speak to your servants. You call shepherds. You call pastors. You call evangelists. Lord, you call us to a certain work, and you've called me to a pastoral message today, and I pray, Lord, that in its simplicity it will find its place in our heart. Lord, we humble ourselves before you, and we ask for the unction and the anointing that makes the word life-changing. Don't let it fall to the ground, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> to what purpose was the Holy Spirit given to you? I want you to picture with me for a moment that marvelous scene on the Mount of, of uh, Translation when Jesus is taken up into the heavens. <clears throat> now, these disciples who gathered still don't get it. They still don't understand. They're still shocked and surprised that he's not set up his earthly kingdom here on earth. That's what they thought he came to do, to drive the Romans out of Jerusalem and out of Judea, and out of Israel, and set up a kingdom, and they all were going to have a very important place in this kingdom. They're still thinking that way when they stand watching him ready to depart. His closing directions had been to them, tarry at Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Said, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And you know what they're saying to him? Even though these are his last words, he's about to ascend to the Father and to the glory. And they've just heard that the Holy Ghost is going to come upon them. And they're still saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore 
again the kingdom of Israel. In other words, you are not going to be king. You're not setting up the earthly kingdom, but are you empowering us to do that now? Are we going to be the prime minister? Who's going to be uh, ruler? And they're still thinking, are you setting up your kingdom at this time? They totally missed it. These disciples didn't understand Christ's message that his kingdom was not of this earth. It was a spiritual kingdom. It was set up in the hearts and the minds of individuals. A spiritual kingdom. They're still thinking physical kingdom. They're still thinking Roman soldiers. They're still thinking about taking power and authority in the flesh. Now, Jesus, before he left, gave some wonderful, marvelous promises. Remember he said, my peace, I leave with you. My peace I'm giving to you. That's an uh, incredible statement. He said, you haven't known the kind of peace that I'm going to bestow upon you now through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you my peace, the peace that has maintained me through my ministry here, the peace I've had all my time as incarnate in the flesh. I'm giving it to you now. And then he says, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Wonderful promises. But the most wonderful promise of all is that they were going to receive the Holy Spirit. He said, it's important, it's expedient that I go away, because if I don't go away, I can only be with a number of you. My kingdom is going to expand. There are going to be millions of you, like the sands of the sea. It's going to be all over the world. I can only be at one place at one time, but it's expedient. It's important that I go, and I am going to take of my spirit because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. He is the Spirit of Christ. I'm going to take of my spirit so that I am not going to walk with you. I will not be beside you, but I will be in you. I will be with you. You're going to see me again, but you're going to see me in the inner man. I am going to be poured out upon you, and all the resources that I have are going to be in you. You won't have to come and talk to me. You won't have to walk beside me. I am going to be in you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm going to come and live in your body. I'm going to live in you. Now, Jesus had spent, what, three years with these disciples, and uh, they didn't understand. They were not comprehending. In fact, Jesus says there's many things. If you go to, to John, the 16th chapter, you might just go there and leave it open because I'll be referring to this. Go to John, the 16th chapter, if you will, please. <clears throat> or the 14th chapter. Sorry, it is the 16th chapter. John 16, 14th is good on the Holy Ghost also. I'll be referring to that. But right now, go to the 16th chapter of John, if you will, please. Now, let's. Uh, I just want you to read with me, uh, verse begin at verse seven. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth: it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. When he's come, he'll reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the Prince of this world is judged. I have many things to send to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now, look at me, please. This is an amazing statement. Isn't it, isn't it something? Who, who could have been more intimate with Jesus than these disciples? They, they ate with him. They walked with him. They talked with him. They slept with him. He taught them many, many things. He, they saw miracles. Uh, he, he told them of the Father. He taught them to pray. Uh, he washed their feet. He told them eternal values, and, and he's saying there's so many things. I I want you to know so many things I want to teach you, but you can't grasp them. It's not within your power to understand. No matter what I would tell you, no matter how deep I want to take you, you don't have the capacity to understand. You don't even understand the spiritual kingdom. You're not understanding the rudimental, fundamental truths that I'm trying to get into your heart so that you can carry on my kingdom, my spiritual kingdom. But he said, nevertheless, however, there's something going to happen. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. My spirit is going to come upon you. Verse 13, Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. 
and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and will show it unto you. Now look at me, please. Jesus, I, I, I really know in my heart why he could leave them now, and with such joy, leave them on earth and ascend to his Father and to his former glory. He's leaving with great joy. Can you imagine the anticipation, the joy of our Savior as he's going back to the Father? But you see, Jesus knows what these men face. He knows what his church is going to face. He looked down the corridors of time in his, in his holy mind, and he saw the coming persecutions. He saw all the Roman empires that would destroy multitudes of them. He saw the viciousness of those who thought they'd be doing God a favor by killing his own disciples. He knew they would be beheaded for the sake of the gospel. They would be slandered and maligned. They would be called the scum of the earth. He knew that they would be crucified upside down. He knew there would be despair. He knew all the crisis and the problems his disciples were facing. Yet he could leave them with great joy and expectancy. Because he knew. He knew that he was leaving. He was sending the Holy Ghost who would have all the resources that they would ever need. All the power, all the glory, all the might that they had every resource as if Jesus walked side by side with them, lived in their house, slept with them, walked with them, talked with them. They would have all the resources that were in Christ. He says, all things that the Father hath in mind, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. He will have rested in him every resource that is in me. As the son of the living God, these resources are going to be in you. You may not be able, I may not deliver you from being beheaded. You may lose, take the spoiling of your goods, your house, your family may be taken from you. But I am going to have in you such a spirit of grace and such power that you will not fold up. You will not have to give in. You will not have to uh, die in despair because I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you grace to face any situation, any crisis, financial, physical, spiritual, mental. I'm going to give you everything you need. I'm sending you the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. What a wonderful, wonderful gift. <clears throat> Beloved, the disciples had the law of Moses. They, they had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They had the Psalms. They had the prophets. <coughs> and yet they do not understand. They are not comprehending. They're not grasping. Jesus is saying, and they had Christ who is the living word. And even though they had the living word, they were not comprehending. And, and the Lord seems to say, I'm not going to take you any further than this. There's something more that's needed. Folks, I want to tell you, I want to make a statement and hear it, and hear it well in your inner man. This word, this word of God is a living word, but it cannot be comprehended. It cannot be understood without the work and the ministry of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit has to bring it to life. The Holy Spirit is, is, we, we say the letter killer. That's speaking of the law of Moses. It's not that this scripture is a dead book. This book is full of life. But for you and I to understand it, the life that's in it, to be uh, injected into us, that we be begin to comprehend it, it's because we must have, we need the Holy Ghost to open our eyes. I, I have heard ministers preach sermons that were theologically very correct, the man very serious, the word preached with with uh, fervor and sincerity, and it's very evident the man has done his study and his homework, he's, he's had his theological background, he gets up, and the word sounds good, it's proper, but it doesn't move you. It, 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 I, I said, well, that, that was all right, but it didn't do anything for me, it didn't change me, it didn't stick with me, because it was not under the unction, it did not have with it the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I have pastors write to me almost weekly. Confessions. One dear, uh, I was going to name the denomination, I won't name it. 
But this dear pastor wrote to me a loving letter. He, he said, Brother Dave, I feel like I'm just an empty uh, echo in the pulpit. He said, I study, I pray, I seek the Lord, I am sincere, and I get up and the words just seem to fall right down in front of me. I, there's no light, there's no power. It, it, it doesn't even affect me. I'm just saying words I hear echo out of my mouth. And folks, the reason for that is because the man has not been, he has not been moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. He has not been under the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to make that word come to life. Only life produces life. If there's death in me, I can't give you life. If I don't have the Holy Ghost, if I'm not walking and living in the Holy Ghost, and if I'm not receiving the word from the Holy Ghost, and if I'm not preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, it's not going to change you. It's not going to change anybody. It's going to be the dead letter. We must have the Holy Spirit to understand and even to live the word of God. Many things they could not understand, but the moment the Holy Ghost came upon them, they understood it. Peter could stand and preach with with an understanding that just absolutely opened up. Suddenly the lights were turned on. Suddenly he understood what Jesus had been saying all these months that he'd been with him. The understanding was opened. Hallelujah. <coughs> he is the spirit of truth. The scripture said he will abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now, beloved, my message is not complicated at all. I simply want to uh, persuade you this afternoon how very personal the giving of the Holy Spirit is, how very personal it is. <clears throat> Most Christians do not know the Holy Spirit in an intimate, personal way. They talk about being intimate with Jesus, but they do not know what it means to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. And you cannot be intimate with Jesus without the ministry of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the one who produces the intimacy. He's the way maker into the intimacy of Christ. He doesn't speak of himself. He speaks of Christ. He opens Christ. He brings to remembrance everything about Christ. How can you be intimate with Jesus without being very intimate with the Holy Ghost? To, to most Christians, the Holy Ghost is like a cosmic, impersonal atmosphere who wastes around in and out of your life. It's like a perfume. Sweet perfume that comes and goes. If you say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, he's gone. But he, they, they, they see him, he is a spirit, but they, they, he is also the third person of the Godhead. He has a personality. And he lives in places. And folks, this is the place he lives, in our temple. It's called the temple of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> to what purpose was the Holy Ghost given to you, and to what advantage in your life. Many who claim to be in and of the Spirit have really had no real effect. They live like other people. They, some, they, they have as much wretchedness and miserableness as anyone else on the job. They go to church and they don't understand. They're just as dead as anybody else. And they claim to be baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. But I ask you, to what advantage? That's the purpose of my message. It's true that most Christians believe that he's doing a great work in the earth. You know, that he has come to reprove the world, the great big globe. He's come to the planet to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. And they're not a Christian anywhere who doesn't believe the Holy Ghost is at work. In Manchuria, in little villages, the Holy Ghost is moving in little towns and mountain villages and, and some most innocent uh, little Christians are having great revivals in Manchuria. We believe that God is moving in Afghanistan in those little village churches, in the little hideaways. We believe that the Holy Ghost is working in India and in China, thousands and even millions being converted. We, we believe that He's in Iraq right now. I know the Holy Ghost is in Iraq. If you've just been listening to the news, Saddam's own son, uh, son-in-law has just escaped and three other members of that 
so-called royal family, and they say they escaped because they're going to bring Saddam down. The Holy Ghost just moved in there, blew them out, and God changed. God, the Holy Ghost is in charge of all the kingdoms of the earth. You know that. You know what some people don't understand? Oh, I'm so glad the Lord taught me. Every war, everything that's happening on the globe right now has to do with God's eternal interest with his church. Everything. See, God, God moves nations. He moves presidents. He moves kings just to take care of his little flock. Everything that's happening has to do with God's spirit with his flock. All these world leaders getting together thinking, what are we going to do? And why are we doing this? Why are we doing They don't understand why they're doing it. It's all God is mo moving and manipulating and planning because he's protecting his bride. Every war, every major happening on the face of this earth is the Holy Ghost taking care of his bride. <coughs> Now, we, we know that in 1973, there was a lady named Norma McCorvey. She became the symbolic plaintiff in the abortion rights case. Roe versus Wade, remember? She, she, was, she was the Jane Roe. Did you see the papers today? She got saved. <laughs> she was walking... Uh, past the playground and the playground was empty and there were three or four swings and they were just swinging in the wind and there were no children and, and, and terror struck her heart. She said, they're killing all the children. No children in the playgrounds. The Spirit of God came on her and she was led to Christ and now she's joined the fight against abortion. Amazing. The Holy Ghost. Oh, See how we marvel at the work of the Holy Ghost in the world? Oh, she, Madeline Mary O'Hara. She was the one who successfully drove prayer out of our American schools. President of the uh, Atheist Society of America. But the Holy Ghost, she couldn't keep the Holy Ghost out of her own house. Holy Ghost went in her own house, saved her son, and he's preaching Christ. <laughs> The Holy Ghost moved into the Kremlin, blew the Kremlin away, pulled down the Iron Curtain. Now he's flooding the Russian front and everybody all over Russia. Bibles are pouring in. Our people are over there right now. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. We marvel at that. We see, you know, wonder what the Lord's doing in, in the world. But folks, we are missing the personality, the, the, the very personalness of the Holy Ghost. He was given to you. He was given to me. He was not just given to the world to come as some impersonal spirit to move on nations and peoples. He was given to you. Listen to what the scripture says. How clear the comforter will come unto you. The father will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. You will know him. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. He will guide you. He will show you things to come. I will send him unto you. You. Until you grasp that. The Holy Ghost is at work in the world, but he's mine. He is mine. He's my guide. He's my teacher. He's my comforter. He's in me. In John's revelation, all seven churches of Asia were birthed by the Holy Spirit. They're living in the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Ghost speaking through John to the churches of Asia. And the Holy Ghost is speaking to these churches because it says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. It's the Spirit speaking through the pen of John. Now, this is what the Holy Spirit saw in the churches. A loss of first love, a church falling into lethargy, false doctrines creeping in, fornication, all forms of idolatry, seductive Jezebel teachings, adultery, deadness, empty forms of worship, loss of power, spiritual blindness, lukewarmness, loss of communion with Christ, wretchedness, misery. Do you have ears to hear the the Spirit on three occasions says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. What is the Spirit saying? 
You read all this, but do you stop and hear the inner man? What is the Holy Spirit saying to us? He's speaking to us. What is the Holy Spirit saying? He's saying the same thing he's saying to us. I've been sent to every one of these. He was sent to every one of these Asian churches. He was sent to every believer in those Asian churches with all the wisdom, the knowledge, the power, the resources that are in Christ. They were in him. He said, I have been sent to do all things and perform all things as surely as if Christ walked with you on this earth. Why then? Is it, why are God's people leaving their first love? If he has come to lead us into all truth, why is Laodicean church in such blindness? If he has come to give us the riches of Christ, why are they poor? Why are they wretched? If with the mind of Christ is in us through the Holy Ghost, where is the power? Why is John seeing him, the one who laid his head on his bosom, his dear friend, why is he see him now come at walking among the seven candlesticks, which were the seven churches of Asia? And why are his eyes blazing? And why is there a sharp word, a two-edged tongue, a sword pouring out of his mouth? Speaking at the church with fire and thunder. And what is he saying? What is he saying? These seductive teachings and the wretchedness and the misery and the poverty. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. What if Jesus had delayed his crucifixion <clears throat> just long enough to minister for three years in these Asian churches? He, he delayed his crucifixion. He delayed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And he travels, did Paul, to all these seven churches. And he, he gave the living word. He was the word and he expounded to them. And he, he made visit after visit after visit to these seven churches. Would they have been any different? No. The scripture makes it very clear. He would have had to have ended his time with them. And he was saying, there were so many things I wanted to tell you, but you can't grasp them. They needed the Holy Ghost. They received the Holy Spirit. But to what advantage? To what advantage? They had the Holy Spirit. Why did they end up in such a sad state? Why is there such incredible blindness? Christians so deceived that they thought they were near perfect. When they were absolutely deceived, they were wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This is what the Holy Spirit's wanting to know. That's what he's asking. How is it with all the resources available? How is it that you can say that you walk and live in the Holy Spirit and you live in such poverty? You walk in such blindness. Here is Jesus saying to the seven churches, he's saying, repent, or I'll remove your candlestick. In other words, I'll take away your reason for existence. You won't even be called to church. He says to another, repent, or else I'll come unto you quickly, and I'll fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Another, he says, I'll send you into great tribulation. Another, I'll spew out of my mouth. It, did the Spirit speaking... Through John's pen, have a right to speak so sharply to his own spirit-filled people. Very. Why, why is the Holy Spirit so grieved here in the first three chapters of the Revelation of Jesus Christ? Why such grief of the Holy Spirit? Why such threats to His own church? <coughs> Lovingly, yes. Because even the Laodicean church, you know, when it says, I'll spew you out of my mouth, God wasn't eating his church. Please understand, he wasn't chewing up his church. He's not trying to digest his church. When it says in his mouth means, you know, what comes out of his mouth, two-edged sword, it's the word that is in his mouth. He's talking about people who once were in the word. He said, I'm going to spew you out. There'll be no understanding. There'll be no, uh, there'll be no discernment. He's not sending them to hell. He's not damning his people. But he, what he is saying, because in the next few verses, you say he's knocking at the door. He said, buy of me. He's knocking at the door. He's longing to come in and sup with them. He loves them dearly. There's so many being spewed out of his mouth. They're living without 
that that's why so many of these manifestations that are foolish are coming into the church. They've been spewing out of the mouth of God. The two-edged sword is there no longer. They're not walking in the power of the two-edged sword. They're not walking in the spirit of his mouth. Why is the Holy Spirit so grieved here? I kept thinking, God, why are you so grieved? Why is it, it, are you speaking so sharply to the church? It's the same reason he has grieved about many of us in this church. I have grieved him in this matter. The Holy Spirit is sharply grieved with some of us sitting here right now hearing me. Here it is. They had all that is in the power of the Holy Spirit available. And they ignored him. They hamstrung him. And they went their own way, seeking their own counsel from crisis to crisis to crisis. They endured their blindness. They endured their emptiness. They endured their misery. They went from misery to misery, crisis to crisis, and did not call on the Holy Ghost, did not use him. They abandoned his power. They ignored his power. Very few Christians, when they get in trouble and when they're hard places, run com- run immediately to the Holy Ghost. You know, I, I, I had a picture in my mind coming to church uh, just before this service in my house. I'm picturing a big crusade, a great big bowl, 20,000 people or so in this big uh Amphitheater, and there's a great evangelist there who advertises himself a man of power, and full of the Holy Ghost and light. And we've got all 20,000 eyes waiting to see the Holy Ghost do something through one man. They're all waiting to see, all on the edge of their seat, excited. Folks, and I'm not putting this down. But they're all looking down there to watch what the Holy Ghost is doing. You know what I saw? I saw the Holy Ghost down here on stage looking up at 20,000 people. Watch and see, well, what are they going to do now? Uh, are they going to tomorrow see it's just as important that I help them in their argument with their boss? And when they're leaving the house in the morning and things are all wrong, they turn to me and get grace and power for the day. Where are the 20,000 miracles on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday out there? They're looking at this one man, the Holy Ghost, looking at 20,000 people saying, I want to see not here one man. Folks, it's not enough to come and say, that was the Holy Ghost meeting. What about a Holy Ghost wake up in the morning? What about a Holy Ghost subway ride? What about a Holy Ghost lunch? What about a Holy Ghost coming home, take your wife in your arms, and a Holy Ghost kiss? And the Holy Ghost moving all day long. What's wrong with that? <clears throat> Why else would such an ed- educated prosperous, gifted churches in Laodicea end up with so many rich and miserable, poor, blind, naked believers. How could it be but that they had ignored and not consulted and not appropriated the great power and the ministry of the Holy Ghost? And folks, that is what grieves the Holy Spirit today about you and me. That, that, that we do not appropriate this power. We're, we're looking for counselors. Some of you people are still paying a hundred dollars, two hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, getting on TWA, going here, going there to get a word from somebody. Somebody lay you down and pop you. I'm not trying to be facetious, but folks, when are you going to depend on the Holy Ghost yourself and not look for some man? We've got a problem in the church, folks. It's a big problem. We've got an ironclad covenant of the Holy Ghost that he has come to abide. He doesn't flit in and out. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. We may make him grieve. We may make him weep. But he said, I'm with you. I am with you till you die. I'm with you. I will minister to you. I'll minister to you. I'm available. Call upon me. But why so many... So-called spirit-filled Christians walking in utter confusion. Do you know what pastors tell me? That, 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 uh, that there, there are people are coming to them saying, 
what's happening? We, we don't understand what's happening in all these manifestations. There's such confusion in the churches today. Thousands of Christians confused. They don't know what's right. They don't know what's wrong. You know what's wrong with that whole scene? Is that they have not been shut in with the Holy Ghost. They don't believe that He is their guide. That He will guide them. He will teach them. He will show them. If they'll just spend quality time with Him, they'll know it in the inner man. Nobody has to tell them. The Holy Ghost will tell you. It's not enough to say I've been baptized with the Holy Ghost. I can speak with tongues and I can prophesy. I want to hear somebody say, I appropriate him. I use him. I use him in my everyday life. I use him every time I get upset. I was just about to tell you how Brother Carter had to use him. When his wife came home and he painted the wrong color in the kitchen. <laughs> I've never seen you so red in my life. Okay. How about that color, red? There, there. There's not a Christian here in this house this afternoon who, who would not readily acknowledge, I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. I believe He's my guide. I believe He's my friend. He's my comforter. Folks, that's lip service. We can say that so glibly. And then when we get into a hard place, we are slandered. We have a crisis financially or something else happens. We go to anybody, we run to anybody, we're in a panic. We don't know the rest that remains for the children of God. And I'm telling you, only the Holy Ghost, only relying on the Holy Ghost can bring you into that rest. Why was he given? To what advantage? That in these crises. Now let me tell you, uh, before I close, I'm not going to preach much longer, but I've got to get to this. I want to talk to you about who grieves the Holy Ghost the most. It's not the mugger. Not the man on the street. It's not the lukewarm Christian. It's not the dead Christian. The one who wounds the Holy Spirit and grieves him the most <clears throat> is the one who has known how to walk in the Holy Spirit and have, through, through exercise, practice, have utilized the Holy Spirit, have found him faithful for years. They have taught the Holy Spirit. They know the Holy Spirit. He said, He's been in you. will know Him. And they have known Him. They have walked with Him. <clears throat> but there comes one battle too much. <clears throat> one slander too vicious. One battle too overpowering. And a weariness sets in. And up to this point, God could point to this man or this woman to, to, and say to the devil, just like he did for Joe, look at Brother Dave, or, or look at Sister McIntyre, look at Brother Brown, whatever the name may be. Look, you see, when they get in trouble, when they're in a crisis, when things go wrong, they immediately run to the Holy Spirit. They immediately draw on His inner strength. They begin to commune with the Holy Ghost. I worked with Sister Catherine Coleman for five years in the car, on the elevator, in, in the restaurants. She was always talking, half the time not to me. <laughs> and my wife, she's talking to the Holy Ghost. She's talking to him all the time and not some silly talk. Holy Ghost is not some silly personality. I'll tell you what he's going to talk to you most about how to grow in Jesus. He's going to tell you how to grow up. He's going to reveal. He'll show you things to come about, things to come in your life about revelation, how he's going to open up your mind until, until finally the greatest joy in your life is not getting, uh, winning some lottery somewhere. You shouldn't be, you win a lottery. I'll tell you one thing. I was going to say, don't give it here to the church. 
I'm saying Al because we've got Christians playing numbers and lottery. It, that's gambling. It's out and out gambling. Now you take that for what it's worth, but <clears throat> probably not going to be worth anything to you because you wouldn't win it anyhow. The Lord will see to that. <clears throat> but you see, there, there, there's a place in the Holy Spirit where your finally your greatest joy is a revelation of Christ. Something, something sweeter, something more powerful. He opens the word to you. You see things you've never seen before. That becomes more important than money, clothes, cars, human love, anything else. I tell you now, I, I know it. I, I can say it before a holy God. My wife can vouch for this. The greatest joy in my life when the Holy Spirit comes and reveals Something fresh about the heart of Jesus. I get ecstasy. I get excited. You can have my car. You can have my... Now, don't take me serious, but... <clears throat> Somebody go and come claim the car. Spiritually speaking... <laughs> How many know what I mean? You, you say, Holy Spirit, I know you're my guide and I need direction and he will. If you just seek him, it'll come. Isn't it's not going to come? He's not going to send you a fortune cookie with it inside. It's, it's, going to come, it's going to come to you in ordinary ways sometimes. You just block a path here, block a path, and suddenly the only doors left is the right one, and that's the Holy Ghost leading you. He will lead you in practical ways, but oh, you finally come to this place. <clears throat> the real advantage of the Holy Spirit in being intimate with Him is that I'm allowing Him to do what He's been sent to do. And that's all that it means to walk in the Spirit. Let Him do what He's been sent to do. To lead me into the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, it puts a change in your countenance. It, it puts joy in your heart. And you know you can have that on your job. You don't have to be a preacher. He wants that for every one of us. He, he wants you to be able, how be it when he, the spirit truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. He's going to show you things about the coming of the Lord. He's going to show you... We're going to see a lot of that tonight about the coming of the Lord and what he's going to show us. All He shall glorify me. You can be on a job and he'll glorify you right through the, the word and the revelation. He receive of mine and he'll show it unto you. And Brother Carter was talking about taking a little Bible into to a little cubbyhole somewhere on the job and reading it and somebody's going to hear a screech and a scream. You know what it is? God spoke to you, a revelation. You come out of there smiling and everybody says... Well, they won the lottery. They won the $300 ticket. Uh, something wonderful's happened. No revelation of the Holy Spirit has come. Revelation. Walking and living and moving in the revelation of the Holy Ghost. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to preach it. It's something that you get from your own heart and you ponder it. You don't go around boasting about it, but it's bringing life to your spirit, bringing life to your body and your soul. Hallelujah. Well, I better quit. <laughs> to what advantage is the Holy Spirit that has been given to you? Are you leaning on Him? Oh, folks, I talk to Him every waking hour. Wake up in the middle of the night, I talk to Him. Now I'm in trouble, I call on Him. Where is He? He's not out there. In China, so busy, He doesn't have any power and time for you. No, 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 no. He can take care of the whole world and still count every hair on your head. <clears throat> if you're bald, every follicle, he can, <laughs> he can do it. His thoughts are so many towards you, you can't comprehend them. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you have the Holy Ghost? Let's stand.
Hallelujah. How many of you fellows from Timothy House know you can walk every single day in the power of the Holy Ghost? Direction, anointing, comfort, strength, power, everything you need is in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. <coughs> Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this church. You are welcome in this vessel. This is your temple. This is your body. Lord, we've got to start showing the advantage of our walk with you. There has to be an advantage. You were given, Lord, to meet every need. Oh, meet every need here. Holy Spirit, meet every need. Hallelujah. Lord, for those that are hungry, Holy Ghost has enough food to fill every hungry spot. He can fill every belly. Hallelujah. Every sadness you can drive away and restore gladness. Oh, God, for every wretchedness, every blind eye, you can open them. You can give wisdom and knowledge and truth. It's all in you. Hallelujah. All that is in Christ has been deposited in the Holy Spirit and deposited into our very physical bodies. Not just our spiritual.